Man, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of EOS. I got a souped up video for y'all today. This is gonna be, you know, 100% dedicated to somebody who is not able to come on to the show due to the fact that they are still incarcerated. But that doesn't mean I can't show y'all pictures and videos of who I'm talking about. Hey man, bro, I can't in the beard of fuck, nigga. Know your boy, boot pussy, nigga. You heard that? Straight up. I'm gonna get to you, nigga, uncut, man. Uh-huh. Pop his ass. Stop playing, bitch. Stop playing with his ass. Stop playing with his ass. Stop playing with his ass. Rockstar shit. Rockstar shit. Rockstar shit. Rockstar shit. Rockstar shit. Stop playing with his stupid ass. Stop playing with his stupid ass. Bitch, Rockstar shit. Stop playing with his stupid ass. Rockstar lifestyle. Always, bitch. He's side up, man. He's everything, bitch. I don't make shots. Turn that little nigga all the way up, bitch. Diamond game, fuck nigga. I don't bang, you heard me? Yeah. I sell goof, fuck nigga. AKA, Mr. Ain't have a chain snacks yet. I've been waiting on this one. I ain't even gonna lie. I've been waiting to talk about him. I met Goo. 2014 at Appalachia CI. Now I told y'all I had to hit out on my head by my own people. They wanted to hit me up. They wanted me out of there. And Goo came. And when Goo came, you know, it was presented to me. I can either rock with the movement he's trying to create or I'm going to get chewed up like everybody else. You know what I'm saying? Because when he came, it was you're either going to move how you're supposed to or you're not gonna move at all on this compound. And I was all for doing what I was supposed to do. That's what I was already doing. So of course, I'm like, hell yeah. Now, the first time I heard about Goo, somebody told me that one of my brothers was moved into another quad. And at this time, I wasn't even cool with my brother. So I'm thinking like, all right, it's just going to be another person that I got to watch for. You know what I'm saying? I, I still got to carry this knife. I got to walk around ready to hit up whoever because I'm pretty sure eventually they're going to try to strike. And then I heard his name held weight. He wasn't just a regular person. You know what I'm saying? So hearing that. I thought to myself, well, I probably don't have to worry about him directly. If his name carries weight, he's not going to be a, like, he's ain't, he ain't going to be the one that does it. But if his name carries a certain amount of weight, he can get the job done faster than these kids who were trying to hit me up could. You know what I mean? If he was actually someone people really listen to, someone would really go out of their way to make something happen as far as getting me off the compound. But the complete opposite happened. You know, like I said in the other video, we had that meeting when it was me, him, Rambo, and another blood, and everything got cleared up. That, you know, Goo was the one that brought unification to the Appalachian Correctional Institution compound amongst the bloods. It wasn't that he was the top blood, had a crazy rank, nothing like that. He had the most smarts out of everybody. He was the one that was the most logical. You know, it wasn't just resorting straight to violence. It wasn't just about, you know, just stupid things. How it was running like such a renegade compound. He brought unity and he brought structure to that compound. Who eventually got moved into my dorm, into Quad 4. So I'm in the room with Bimba when this happened. And we were in two bottom. Goo got moved into two top, right above me. You know, the guy that's pretty much pulling the weight for us is above my cell. You know what I'm saying? So, usually, you might know all, the, all of your people on the compound, but the people that are in your dorm or in your cell is who you're going to get the closest with. Especially if they're in your circle, like how Bimbo was in my circle. You know, and being that he was right up top, we got cool and we got cool quick. That was something about Goo that took a lot of people off God is he looked past my skin color, fully accepted me as being white. And I mean, don't get me wrong. He heard stories about me. He heard about what I was doing at the YO camps. 
he heard I was putting in work. You know what I'm saying? He heard how I extorted the older guy that had the sex charge. And um, he respected it. You know what I mean? And when you tell someone about you, you're saying something. But when you... Well, really, you're not saying anything. But when someone else tells someone about you, it speaks louder. And the fact that so many people were going to him speaking highly of me, he never felt that I needed to prove myself to any extent with him. You know what I'm saying? He already knew what time it was. And more or less, he took me under his wing. You know, this is someone that showed me the ropes as far as anything goes. He he saw potential in me and he saw loyalty. I didn't have money. I didn't have, you know what I mean? Like, it's one thing if you're someone that, like, you're bringing dope on the compound or you got a lot of money, you can make things happen. I didn't have nothing to offer except for loyalty. You know what I mean? I'm loyal, period. And I can be violent. I can be very violent. And I mean, that has value inside of prison as well. But he saw potential. And that's what made the difference between me and other people within our organization. You know, some people, they're not willing to listen. They're not willing to just shut their mouth and listen to someone teach them. And in prison... People don't teach you like, hey, bro, I'm going to sit you down and teach you how this works. It doesn't happen like that. People won't waste their time like that. Everything in prison is a mind game, a chess game. It's thought out beforehand. So he would indirectly teach me something or indirectly spit knowledge and wait to see my reaction to what is being said. He would do things in a manner where it was almost a puzzle having a conversation with him. I have to put the pieces together to figure out the meaning of what he was actually saying. And it was through me solving these riddles and puzzles that I gained his respect and I gained his trust and I gained a brother, a big brother, aside from being blood. I gained a mentor because I was willing to listen. I was willing to push through these things he kept putting in front of me. And I mean, it makes sense. You're not going to waste your time teaching someone that isn't going to listen. You're not going to waste your time. You're not going to waste your time teaching somebody you don't think is going to be able to handle what you're teaching to them. But like I said, he saw potential. Now, Goo... Just to give you a little backstory on him. Goo is from Broward County. He's from Pompano. If y'all know Kodak Black, Pompano, know your boy, that's the same hood that Goo from. Goo's just an older generation. So no, I didn't know Kodak. Goo didn't know Kodak. But Kodak homeboy, Pompano Randy, and shout out to Randy. That's Goo's nephew. And I never knew that until actually after I got out. I reached out to Randy, you know, on some, hey, my bro from Pompano, I don't know if you know him, da da da. But if you promote his video, I'd appreciate it. And come to find out, he busts me a message back talking about, that's my uncle. Big shout out to Pumpin' on Randy, man. He'll fire your ass up. But that's where Goo from, you feel me? And Goo, his charges came from a string of armed robberies on Walgreens and CVS's pharmacies. He was accused of basically being a part of a group that was going in, laying the place down, taking everything out of the pharmacy, taking the money. And going on to the next spot. You know what I mean? And he was accused of doing multiple stores. Which led up to him being convicted of multiple robberies. Now, what in my opinion really buried him in a sense. 
not into the ground, but in prison, was one of these robberies. Apparently, there was a sheriff outside in a car. And push come to shove, that sheriff was shot multiple times in that vehicle. And he didn't make it. He was he wasn't a new cop or nothing like that. You know, he was a sergeant, he had rank, he had been in the Broward County Sheriff's Office for quite some time. This was I believe the most high profile murder of a law enforcement officer in southern Florida, if not the state of Florida, due to the fact that to this day it is still unsolved. They accused Gu and his group of that murder. You know, they were under investigation. I believe this was after they had already got arrested and they were trying to put two and two together. All right, these guys are robbing these type of stores. They came out, they seen a, a cop. The cop gets killed, you know what I mean? So. It made his case that much more high profile. And when something like that happens to you, you best believe that these police officers, these sheriffs, these judges, they hold a grudge. This isn't something that's taken lightly whatsoever. While Gu was in Broward County Jail, he was also accused of having a CO bring him contraband. The CO was arrested. It was a female CO. And they basically said that she was bringing in, you know, cell phone, drugs, etc. Gu had a hell of a talk game. He's a smooth talker, you know what I mean? And when he smiled him gold teeth at you, he just got a way of finessing. And more or less, that's what I'm assuming happened with this, you know, jail officer. And she was fired. She was arrested. Gu was arrested. And Gu was actually convicted on a contraband charge. So by the time Gu was convicted, they weren't able to be charged with the murder. Um, there was multiple things that led to them not being able to be convicted on that one of them being the lack of a weapon but he was convicted on the robberies and he was given 50 years for each robbery totaling 400 years they ran a concurrent 50 year sentence right now his release date is 2056 he was arrested in 06 I met him in 14 just to give you an idea on how much time he had already been down for by the time that I met him. One of his co-defendants was given a life sentence because he had prior convictions already versus Gu didn't have any priors. I believe the other co-defendant or the other person involved in the case was given a much lesser term, more or less because he turned over evidence to the state. Could you imagine having a 50 year sentence at 24 years old? It's insane to think of that much time. You can't. You can't even think of that much time. And the reason I believe he was punished like that, because the lack of evidence in his case is ridiculous. You know what I mean? Police went into his phone without a warrant. There's so many flaws within his case. It's, it's tough when you don't have the money to make things happen. You know, you see a lot of rappers that get away with murder. You see a lot of celebrities or a lot of people with money in general that get away with crazy charges. You know what I mean? I believe that Gu was punished severely because of the fact that that sheriff's officer's murder went unsolved. I believe that that is the reason they wanted him to do so much time because in the state of Florida, anyone that kills a law enforcement officer, you're going to death row. That's what's gonna happen. When you go to prison with a charge, like a battery on a Leo, a law enforcement officer, 
or any type of assault on a police officer, any charges like that. When you're in prison, if you catch a charge against a correctional officer, that charge follows you. And when you get to certain prisons, you can get beat because you have those charges. When the, when the correction officers look at your, your record, that could be the reason that you get beaten. That could be the reason you get killed by correctional officers within the prison because you have charges like that. So there's no doubt in my mind that they held a grudge against him because that murder went unsolved to this day it's still unsolved it's the only unsolved murder of a law enforcement officer in the state of Florida to my knowledge it's a messed up case you know what I mean it's a lot of time but when I met him he didn't show that it affected him you know you got a lot of people that they stress out they start going bald they you know, they want to get into the law library, but then they're stressing out and freaking out. And they start lashing out. And he was always realistic about everything. He, he knew that, you know, without money, you can't really make too much happen. Without a voice in court. And when I mean a voice in court, you need a lawyer to speak that lingo. To talk that talk. Inside a court, it's a different language. They speak a different language. And that is law. And the thing about prison, when you want to come back on your time, there's certain things that you can file for to come back on your time, but it needs to be filed in a specific amount of time. When you go to confinement, you have no access to the law library. When you're on the compound, the CEO might tell you to F off when you're going to law library to mail something out that you need mailed out by a specific date. The CEOs play dirty. And when you miss that date and you missed your chance to file and now you can't file, you're looking at that CEO like you just costed me years. You might have just costed me my whole case. I might have just been able to go home. And you know, it's things like that, the the irresponsible acts by the COs and the desperation of the inmates that leads to a lot of COs getting stabbed and attacked. You know what I mean? Like you, you treat everybody badly and then one day you treat the wrong one and he kills you. Because in his head, he had a chance to go home and you just eliminated that for him. So now he's going to eliminate you. And in his mind, it's only fair. Man, when I met Gu, everything about bro was different than everybody else I was around. He moved different. He carried himself different. His presence was felt without anything needing to be said. You just knew something was different about bro. It was in his energy. Energy is everything. It's the first thing you pick up on is someone's vibration. When they walk into a room, when a girl walks into a room that looks better than every girl in there, she got a different kind of walk, a different kind of strut, but she also radiates a different kind of beauty and that energy is what captivates you. So when you got a guy that walks in, you know they have a saying, everybody's a gangster till a gangster walks in. Well, that's what happened when Goo walked in. It was different. You could feel it. I never felt like I wanted to prove myself to Goo, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, that's somebody I wanted in my circle. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I'm grateful that I was able to cross paths with him because of how much knowledge he gave me. You know, it isn't just prison stuff. It isn't, I mean, this man taught me how to talk, walk, fight, everything. How to go about things in a different manner. How to finesse. How to articulate my words. Speech. I wouldn't be talking on YouTube if it wasn't for Goo. When we got into talking. Just talking. Playing chess with your words. Using your words like weapons. Which weapon do you want to use? Do you need to use a nuclear bomb? Or do you need to use a knife? Or do, whatever it is bro. Just learning how to... 
think and process before I speak. Which I used to just speak on impulse. And that's what you... It used to get me into so much negative situations. When I met Goo, it just so happened that a CO, a female CO, got moved into the dorm. And she liked me. And I only knew because she looked at me one time. And at one time she looked at me, she looked at me too long. And I knew at that point it was over with. And how did I know? Because he watched. And he let me know. She looked at you too long. Too long, little bro. She like you. Now you got to make it happen. I was speaking to her without speaking to her. Our main contact was just through our eyes at first. He taught me how to look at her and speak to her without having to say a damn word. And that captivated her attention. More so than any other inmate in here. So you got about 70 to 80 guys in each quad. There's four quads. But for some reason, what I'm doing is working. And mind you, everybody's trying to get at her. Everybody's trying to talk and have their five seconds of fame. But I'm not doing it. When they look, I don't look. When they talk, I don't try to speak. When they're around her, I'm the furthest one away. And that's what got her. That's what made her want to talk to me and find out about me. And she actually started asking around. You know, who is he? What is he a part of? She started talking to my brothers. And before you know it, she reached out to Goo. Oh, I see you always around him. Da 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 da. Why you always around him? What is he? Is he a blood? So you know, Goo put whatever he wanted to in her ear. But when she heard that I wasn't just a regular white boy on the compound, I wasn't a jizzle, I wasn't a punk, I wasn't none of these things that obviously have a bad name, her eagerness to get to know me grew. You know what I mean? Her her want to know who I was grew even more. To the point that now she's starting to call me out of the dorm to come talk to her when the sergeant is doing count in another dorm. So no one can hear us. It's just me talking to her through the window at the booth. Telling me to start writing her notes. Write it on the sit calls. Slide the sit call in so she can read it. Tear it up, throw it away. Whole time, Goo's telling me how to manipulate this conversation. But then eventually he told me, Show me what I taught you. All right. All right, big bruh. I'm going to show you. Push come to shove, I started getting cigarettes every single damn day. Push come to shove, anything that got confiscated in the dorm that we were in. I could get my hands on. If you were doing a tattoo in quad one or quad two and someone recovered your tattoo gun and they put it in the contraband drawer inside of the booth, guess what? She gonna go in that drawer. I'm gonna get that tattoo gun. Me being real, I'm gonna give it back to you. I ain't even gonna keep it. And I'm not gonna ask for money either. I'm gonna give it back to you because I felt like if I have access to things like that but I'm not returning it to the person, for one, that's just lame, bro. I'm in a position to get somebody back their stuff. Why wouldn't I give it back? You know what I mean? But for two, the more I'm able to pull in from her, the further I can take it. So I'd get the tattoo gun back, give it back to the tattoo man. Now he offering me free tattoos. Uh, he's like, you know what, bro? This tattoo gun worth $100. Here, boom. Let me just throw you some canteen. Appreciate that, bro. I ain't even asking. The only thing I wouldn't return is if knives were confiscated. Any form of weapon. Those are mine. Those are for my brothers now. You know better than to ask me for your knife back. It ain't gonna happen like that. And you can't even beef about it because we got the knife. You know what I'm saying? I used to get bleach out of the booth from this correctional officer. So you know what Goo did 
We had all blue uniforms. We stopped dyeing the uniforms different colors. Now we got purple uniforms. Now we got green uniforms, different shades of blue. I might have a green uniform with a purple pocket on the shirt and then purple pants with a green pocket on the pants. I'm talking about the swag got so nasty. And you know what Goo call it? He call it sauce. And we was dripping in sauce in that bill. I'm talking about everything we had. All our uniforms were dyed. All of our whites were coming in brand new. Why? Because we're buying brand new whites because we're getting all this money off of these damn cigarettes. Money, money, money. It got to a point where I had her cell phone number. I told her, don't write it down. Say it to me one time and I'm going to remember it. She said it one time. Later that night when she got off work and the night shift came and we came back out of our cells, we got on that phone. Made a phone call. We got a three-way going. I'm talking to her. She just got home. What's up? What's up? How you doing? This is what I need tomorrow. I'm speaking in cold with her. Boom. She comes through tomorrow. I got what I need now. Whether I got to get it through the booth or whether I got to meet her in the laundry room, whatever it is. Now, the laundry room, ain't no cameras in the laundry room. Ain't no cameras in the booth. But I got her in the laundry room by ourselves. Just me and her. Nobody else with us. No cameras. Whole bunch of mattresses laid out. I could have did what I wanted to if I wanted to. But this was, you know, a few months from me going home. As much as I wanted to, that wasn't the mission at hand. You know, I'm about to go home. I can do that as much as I want when I get out. I got to secure the bag for my brothers. So instead of trying to do that and wasting my time, I got what I needed to get. I got packs of cigarettes. Packs. 200 a pack. I'm talking about we bringing in money. So now me and Goo, we smoking every day. And while I'm doing this, he got a CO on a whole other side of the compound in a different dorm. And he working the same thing with her. Doing the same thing. So I'm wingman. Like, I'm the wingman in this situation. Because that female CO used to be on the rec yard with another one. So Goo would talk to that one while I'm distracting this one. And we were making it happen. And we were a force to be reckoned with. I mean, it got so nasty at one point. I had three different sets of uniforms. Goo had like four different sets of uniforms. Bimba had some fresh ass uniforms. All of us was fresh head to toe. Somebody came from the feds. And in the feds, if you come from the feds to the state and you have sneakers, if they're all white, you can bring them with you. So this man brought all white Air Force Ones with the gold buckle. So Goo was the first one to, to view him, and he got in his chest. What's up, bro? How much you want for them forces, bro? I think the man wanted like 80-something, like street price. Damn near. So Goo like, what's up? What size they is? Boom. Okay, bet. Hold on to them. Don't even talk to nobody else. Goo come back to me. Hey, bro, he got your size, bro. Goo, Goo got small feet. Goo was like an 8 or something like that. I'm 11 and a half. You best believe I bought them forces. All this cigarette money we got, what you want? How you want to get paid? You want half food? You want half cigarettes? You want K2 sprinkled in there? How you want it? Boom, secure that. Another dude from the feds came. He got a red canteen bag. Boom, bought the red canteen bag. So you got a white boy with the freshest uniforms. Matter of fact, you know who else was always fresh? TK. Pfft. Always. Nasty blues, had the fresh reeds, everything. TK was always fresh. But yeah, man, I was the only one stepping in them Air Force Ones on the compound. Only one with the buckle. And I'm talking about, I was getting complimented by COs at that point. Like, who is that? You know what I'm saying? Oh, I like your shoes, bro. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. It was wild, bro. Everything about me just elevated being around this man that was already so high above me. And that's what's crazy. A lot of people viewed it and were like, he really took him under his wing. You know what I'm saying? Because I, I, wasn't, I wasn't moving like that. I didn't have 
fresh uniforms like that. You know, don't get me wrong. I started to crank up with Bimba because Bimba was plugged in with the laundry man. So I started getting a little bit fresher and all that. I wasn't really worried about it. I didn't get money. You know, when the YOs, I never had nice uniforms because we were always going to war anyway. So I didn't see the point in being fresh. I wasn't getting visitations. I wasn't taking prison pictures. I didn't care. But when Goo came, he switched it all up for me. He said, you know what, little bro? You ain't being fresh for the pictures, for the viso, for none of that. You doing it for you. Because when you wake up and you look like this and you feel like this, you going to move like this. And you going to radiate that energy that you view in me. And it was a fact, bro. It was a fact. I had different people trying to be a part of my circle just off the strength of how I was moving off of what I was learning from bro. You know what I mean? It was wild. And I mean, for y'all that don't know, bro can rap too. You know, he used to get into the cell and we'd be in the cell like 10 deep. Damn, big bro, what are you listening to? when nigga talk about getting his money, a nigga like me wanna grab them pistols, monkeys, boots, gloves, man, and they can't get with you. I ask a lot of questions. Man, what he got keys in this bitch? How much cheese in this shit? Cause when I up this stick, man, this bitch don't start till I jam this clip. I leave brains on the pavement. The harder they are, the cheaper the payment. I just do it for the thrill sometimes. I smack your ass for four in the baby. Don't flinch, don't move. A nigga breathe hard, I'ma squeeze hard. In the middle of the wood, no silencer. For what, bitch, can't hear your tree fall? Yeah, I tell you, man. AKA, Mr. I ain't have a chain snatch yet, fuck nigga. Yo, Bo Jackson, throw bike jersey, them hunting summer back. $10,000 for lunch, nigga, that's a snack. I got Jones on the coop, lead prints on the app. Got gloves when I stop, no prints on the bag. Killing them in the money game, $30,000 chain. I can take it off and get a brick for it in the strain. Open up the soda shop, tax free the coat block. Pepsi sprayed on the dunk, call it the coat drop. Fall rain coat drop, where I have the coat spot. Mac Fanny Price and Ricky Williams, what they go for. Romo and the Newton on the eye, bringing the quarterback. Switch hands with the roster, you don't know the quarterback. Money longer than a life sentence, ain't no getting back. Time is money, nigga, do the math, that's a lot of stack. Stick, draw full, make them cute, keep beat. This the Rodney T gang, y'all sweet, we eat. Took a J30 bike and rent the road for the weekend. Death to close the curtain so them hoes couldn't be. You know, once we really started cranking up with the money, that's when we started getting tatted up. You know, we had more brothers get moved into the dorm. I mean, it got to a point where we were one of the deepest things on the compound. You know, and the other organization that was deep was Bimba's. So, you know, we were like this here. We were mad close. Couldn't nobody... If war broke out, they would have got demolished. They would have got assassinated. It wouldn't have worked out for them. You know what I mean? We were deep, but we were strong. The numbers that we had, everybody was solid, period. And at one point, um, there was a shipment of new people that came. So Gu, Gu told me this story after the fact, you know what I'm saying? I wasn't around him when this happened. But basically, he stepped to the new blood that came to the prison. And, you know, what's up, what's up, da-da-da. And he's like... I didn't know where Goo was at the time, but Goo saw me. I was in a different location, you feel me? But he seen me. So he pointed me out, and he's like, oh, yeah, that's the white blood right there. That's the homie. So the new guy told Goo, he's like, white blood? Ain't no white bloods. So Goo looked at him and said, yeah, I bet. Go tell him. And he just looked at him. So he's looking back like, what? And he said, what do you mean? And Goo was like, go tell him. Go tell the white boy he ain't no blood. Go tell him right now. But he's just like, nah. <laughs> nah. 
when you got somebody telling you something like that, go tell him he ain't. You know what time it is. You know what time it is. That white boy gonna leave you on the yard leaking. You know what time it is. So, I mean, he was basically given an option. You either gonna rock with it or rock against it. And he knew better than to rock against it. But at the same time, I never trusted him and never treated him like we were on the same page. Because I feel like if Goo wasn't there, he would have been one of the ones that sided with the other group. And to be an oppressive blood doesn't even make sense if you know the definition of blood to begin with. But that's just how it was. That's just how it goes. Everybody ain't going to accept me. I'm not going to accept everybody. You know what I'm saying? you always going to have an enemy. And that's just it's yin and yang. You can't make everybody happy, but you got to stand on your own. Period. And Goo was standing with me. So it is what it is. Man, I remember one time I was in the shower on the top till. And I heard Goo yelling at somebody. So I'm like, man, what is bro yelling about? You know what I'm saying? What is what is bro doing? I look out the shower. I see him yelling at a white boy. So I'm looking like, you know what I'm saying? Who is this? He must have just got moved in here. The, the cell next to mine was empty. So, you know, I come up out the shower. I ain't even get dressed up. I'm in my boxes. You know what I'm saying? I put my pants on real quick. And I walk down the stairs because my cell's in two bottom. So I see him and Goo rapping. And I yell to Goo. I'm like, hey, bro, what's up? What cell he in? So he tells me he's in the cell next to mine. I threw my stuff in my cell. And I walked off in his cell. In cell three. So I'm telling him, like, hey, bro, come here, bro. So... He ain't even a white boy. He a white dude. He older than me. I was, what, 18, 19 at the time? I was, like, 19 at the time. Nah, I might have been 20, matter of fact. But this man was, like, 25, 26, something like that. He wasn't what you would consider a jit. So I tell him straight up when he comes in, like, hey, this is my cell. Period. You know, I was cussing a little bit more, but I just let him know, this is my cell. He's like, oh, you my bunkie? Nah, but this my cell. And you in my cell. He looked confused, bro. Like, he ain't even understand I'm trying. Either he didn't understand or he didn't want to understand it. You know what I'm saying? So, Goo calls him out. Goo tell him to tighten up. And I guess, um... He basically came into the dorm and disrespected Goo some way, somehow. I'm not sure how it happened, but Goo was never the type to just start something. You know what I mean? So they actually get into my cell and um, they start fighting. So the only people in the cell is me, Goo, and this dude. So when I walked in, he thought we were going to jump him. And we let him know, like, we're not jumping you. Y'all going to fight. And Goo got in there with him. And I'm not going to lie, they were actually teeing off a little bit. You know, they were both standing in that paint. And they was bumping. Boom, boom, boom. But, I mean, Goo getting off on him. Goo hitting him. Every time he hits him, it's cracking him. You know what I'm saying? Like, you could tell he getting damaged off what Goo doing. So, I mean, they went for, like, a little good one round. It stopped for maybe, like, 15 seconds. And then they went back in there. Brrr, and they broke it up. And I was like, man, let me get around. Let me get around. You know, it's just like I said, if you my bunkie, if you my dog, whatever it is, if you fight, I'm going to fight. You swing, I'm going to hit him. If he got a homeboy, I'm fighting his homeboy. He ain't got a homeboy, we're going to line it up. Because ain't nobody spared me. I got lined up, I got jumped, whatever it is. You feel me? So we finna do the same thing because that's just how I work. And that's also how you build your respect is by fighting and getting lined up. You know what I'm saying? So Goo backs up, I get in there with him. I got longer reach than Goo. Goo ain't as tall as me. You know what I mean? I got, I'm got i six foot, six one, height-wise, but I got a six foot reach. So I got long arms. You know what I'm saying? I can hit something. And he came in. When I fight, I fight southpaw. I, I'm a right-handed person, but I've always fought southpaw. And when he came in, I just swung a, a right hook. And bro just walked into it. Boom! 
He went to sleep immediately. Knocked out and just hit the floor. <laughs> So Goo looking at me like, man, bro, why you ain't Ben did that? You got me in here like Rocky Balboa going 10 rounds. You could have been knocked him out. So I started laughing. I'm shocked. You feel me? Because this is only my second knockout ever in my life. My first knockout was in Juvie at the Jack Center. Shout out to Clemmy. Clemmy from the Springs. That's my, that's my dog right there. That's one of the real white boys from the Springs. But it was me and Clemmy in there. Somebody was talking about he from the Springs, he a blood, whatever, whatever. So Clemmy went in the corner to slap box him. And I went up behind him. I stole him and slapped him. That was the first kid I ever knocked out. This was the second. So Goo walks out into the dorm and he yells out, Hey, white boy don't got his first knockout. You know what I'm saying? So he putting on. He happy as a bit because that's big bro. You just saw little bro knock somebody out. You feel proud. Just like how when Bimba saw me slap boss Rambo and I got off for the first time. Because Rambo used to paint me every single time. You feel me? It was just little stuff like that, man. Like, we just did some things where, you know, our bond grew and kept growing. And, you know, we worked out together all the damn time. We were always on the yard together. We always mobbed together, ate together. Everything, you know what I'm saying? If I was broke and he had it, I ate. If I had it and he was broke, he ate. But it was just how, how much he looked out for me. You know what I'm saying? How much he taught me. How much he was able to do for me. And, I mean, bro used to gamble. Goo was a gambler. Goo told me that he had a voodoo lady in Broward County work a little magic. And put it on him when it came to that gambling. You feel me? He was a beast when it came to that poker table. Him and Bimba used to both sit at the table. As long as the winner was in between one of them, everybody was good. You feel me? But he usually gambled against other people. Just so that there wouldn't be no problems between us as friends. As far as like me, Goo, and Bimba when it came to gambling. Because there's times when Bimbo won and it caused issues. There's times when Goo won when it caused issues with people that didn't want to pay. And then there's been times when, you know, it didn't go our way. And, you know, we might not feel like paying at that time. And it just comes down to, is y'all going to rock about it? You know what I'm saying? When Bimba's people in Quad 3 got into it, you know, Bimba told me, I'm sliding over there when the door is open. I went up and told Goo, you know, Bimba said he's going, you know I'm going. And Goo was like, I bet. So when Bimba went over there, I went over there, Goo went over there, and there was probably like 15 bloods that went over there, and a whole bunch of Bimba's people that went over there, and Goo just made an announcement like, hey, if they're going to rock, we're going to rock behind them. The movement was insane. How we all started mobbing together, the unification that we had, you know what I'm saying? Everybody was fresh. Everybody was moving militant-minded, you know? We weren't being friendly. We weren't smiling unless we ain't like you. And he just made such a difference on that compound. He brought peace to that compound. Unless you did something that violated the code of conduct within our organization... We were good. And if you violated that code of conduct, you were gone. And I mean, yeah, there was people that we took out. There was people that we took off the compound, you know what I'm saying, that got hit up. But like I've said in other videos, Goo was one of the major factors in me going home. I got into it with somebody that I really didn't like. And... It wasn't that I necessarily got into it with him. He never said anything to me directly. But he said he doesn't consider whites, bloods. And I mean, he wasn't even rocking with us. He was supposed to be a blood from Miami. But he wasn't mobbing with us. So I felt like he was just using the name just to use it. And I mean, this dude's older. He's in his late 30s. He's probably like 6'3", 6 6'4". 6 He's a big guy. Being honest with myself, I knew I could never beat him in a fight. 
I knew that if I tried to stab him and he took the knife from me, I would I would die. I wouldn't. You know, people think just because you got a knife that that person can't take that knife from you. Or what if he pulls out a knife? Now we go knife to knife. I knew it wouldn't. I knew that I wouldn't be favored in that situation. That things wouldn't be. The only way I get out of that situation is with luck. So I knew that if I was going to strike, I had to do it without him knowing. And I had to do something that he wouldn't be able to recover from. And that's what I wanted to do. And I mean, I was probably only a month and a half away from going home at this point when I wanted to do this, you know? And um, I had plenty of knives. I had knives so big, you gotta try not to kill somebody with them. I mean, these knives were retarded. They're just huge, like that wide, you know, big, just crazy knives, you know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, when it rains in the prisons, we're allowed to run. So normally we have to walk on the right side of the yellow line. There's a yellow line on the walkway. It's kind of like a street. We have to walk on the right. The COs walk on the left. Or inmates coming back from the opposite direction. They walk on the left side. And the COs will stand in the grass. Well, when we go to Chow and it's raining. We run from our dorm all the way to Chow. There's a huge space that has no camera watching. And for the cameras that can see... They're not going to be able to see when that rain is hitting. So a rainy day came. And you know, I have been thinking about this for days and days. I never told anybody. And um, I stepped to Rambo about it. You know, I told Rambo how I was feeling. And I said it's something I wanted to do. And... I asked him just to make sure that if I do it, things don't go south. You know what I'm saying? And Rambo, he got hot to another level. So he was like, man, bro, I'm not only going to watch it. I'm going to participate. You swing, I hit him. That's how we was rocking in there. So I was like, I right, bet we're going to do this together. You know, it's almost time for child. I'm starting to get that feeling in my stomach, that same feeling I got every time I hit someone up. But this time it's gonna be to another extent because I'm not just cutting them. You know what I mean? I'm not hitting them with a lock, I'm not. I'm taking it there. I plan on taking it there and I plan on taking it there to the point that I need to get away with this. Otherwise I'm never going home. You know what I mean? So I stepped to goo about the situation. And um, to basically tell him, you know, what I plan on doing, and this is when I'm going to do it. And bro was completely against it. You know what I mean? He, he just wouldn't let me. You know, he wouldn't. He wouldn't let me, and he sat me down, and we had a conversation. You know what I mean? And through that conversation, he just reminded me. When you go home, you have a responsibility not to live just for you, but to live for me and everyone else that isn't going home for a long time or at all. And it just gave me a different mentality. It was like, you know, here I am about to risk it all over pride as if I haven't learned already how to get over my pride when it came to me hitting someone up over something stupid or me not apologizing to Bimba and him going home knowing that he could have got killed and I could have never said I'm sorry or just any situation you know what I'm saying I was still letting pride affect me and affect my judgment and bro as a real big homie as a real big brother sat me down and talked me through it And it made all the difference because, you know, I didn't go through with it. I wanted to. 
but I didn't go through with it. And come to find out, you know what I mean? Like a week and a half later, this same person ended up getting hit with a brick inside of the chow hall. Someone crashed him, fired him up with a brick in front of everybody, and uh, he got moved out of there anyway. So it's crazy, you know, how things work and how the universe makes things happen. But there's so many reasons that I thank Gu for helping me go home. And I thank him for teaching me vital things that I didn't know inside of prison. And that I didn't know as a man to begin with. You know what I mean? I say that I became a man in prison because of what I learned. Age doesn't mean a damn thing. You got 30-year-olds that act like 13-year-olds. You know what I mean? But when you become a man, it's every single aspect. It's mind, body, and soul. Everything needs to be in unity for you to truly become a man with that knowledge, that experience, that growth. And he was a major factor for who I am today. You know, the the inspiration he gave me being that I was going home and he wasn't. The dedication he gave me to keep me working out and to keep my mind focused and to not lose sight on what's important and falling victim to the, the pettiest things. You know what I mean? When war was breaking out right before I went home, you know, I told Goo, I'm not going to stand behind you. I'm going to stand beside you. And bro just was not letting nothing happen. And he wanted to see me go home and succeed. And it's, it's, it's crazy. I'm so grateful that I'm in a position where I get to speak on him. And tell y'all who he was and who he is to me. You know what I'm saying? How much I look up to him. How much I hope... That the next time I see him isn't when we're in our 60s. You know, I hope that through exposing the flaws within the system and, you know, the courts and everything inside of Florida, that somebody with some common sense can relook into his case and find one of these little loopholes or flaws or whatever in his investigation. When If they can just get rid of that, you know... They wanted him to they wanted to put him away. They wanted to punish him because they couldn't convict him on something else. And even if that wasn't the case, what they punished him for. Fifty years? I can't see my brother for fifty years. Someone that made such a positive impact on my life, I can't see for fifty years. Somebody that helped me become a man. That's crazy. Because it isn't just my life he can affect. He can affect so many other people's lives. But they want him to be in his 60s when he comes home. You know, I wrote to him right when I got out. You know what I mean? It took me some time to get myself together. But I just let him know how much he meant to me. How everything he taught me, I'm still applying it to this day. You know, and there's times when I feel like slipping up. And there's times when I find myself slipping up. And then I might get an email from him off of JPay, And it just gets me right back into that zone I'm supposed to be in. You know what I mean? He just inspired me to become something greater than what I was already. And he showed me that I had the potential to become something he gave me that confidence you know yeah he taught me how to talk to a CEO but it meant so much more than that it, he taught me how to have the confidence to speak to a female how to compete with a couple hundred other men and still be the one that gets her you know what I'm saying still have that confidence so when I got out when I was applying that that same confidence and that same talk game to every other situation I got jobs I got girls I got mad things through conversation I got a YouTube channel 
Because I can tell the same story as somebody else, but the way I tell it is still different. And that's what gets people's attention, is the way I'm able to articulate my words and break down these stories and recall these stories and project them to everybody else. And that's what makes my channel stand out. That's what makes it so that, you know, May 1st, when I started this channel, I'm already almost at 25,000 subscribers because my voice is hitting people differently than other people. And other people might have more savage stories than me, but it's how I'm able to project that story that captivates the people. And I learned this from him. I swear to God, I hope this one day I'm able to get him out here and let him get on YouTube. That man will be a celebrity in two seconds. Real quick, whether it's through rapping, speaking, whatever he gonna do, he gonna do it all the way. And he gonna take it all the way to the top. And that is just what he's doing in prison. Whatever compound he hit, he already all the way at the top compared to everybody else. There ain't nothing they can do. Man, free go, man. I love you, big bruh. I hope that some way, somehow, you're able to hear this. I hope that some way, somehow, you're able to see this one day. I hope I'm able to, to see you on the other side, you know what I'm saying? To get you back out here. I told Gu recently, you know, when he gets his response from the courts, if he goes back to Broward County Court, I'm going to fly down there. Just because um, court is open to the public. And if he isn't released until 2056... I'm at least able to see him in person, in court, even though we won't be able to speak. But I mean, it's just like Gu taught me. We can say a lot without saying nothing, you feel me? And that's real. I love you, big bro. I appreciate everybody that's rocking with me. I appreciate everybody rocking with my story. I appreciate everybody rocking with the channel. All my subscribers, all my new subscribers, if anybody would like to reach out to Goo, contact me on Instagram at 1090 underscore Jake. Until next time.